So that's the that's the nature of it. All right, let's uh, let's uh, find out what other things we can uh, be thinking about and maybe concern mm. about today. All right. <laughs> March 27th, God calls Samuel. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare, uh, of the Lord was rare. There was not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am. You called me? But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am. You called me? My son, Eli, said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now, Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me? Then Eli realized the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So the Lord, so Samuel went and lay down at a, in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other time, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him about, uh, I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Samuel lay down until morning and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision, but Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, here I am. What is it that he said to you? Eli asked, do not hide it from me. May, the, may God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Then Eli said, he is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a, a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear in Shiloh, and there he re revealed himself to Samuel through his word. And Samuel's word became, uh, the, and Samuel's word came to all Israel. Now the Israelites went out to fight the Philistines, and the Israelites camped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines, and the Philistines at Aphek. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel, and as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about four thousand of them on the battlefield. When the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the ark of the Lord, the covenant from Shiloh, so that he may go out with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. So the people sent men to, men to Shiloh, and they brought back the ark of the covenant of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim. And Eli's two sons, uh, Hophi and uh, Phinehas, Phineas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When the Ark of the Lord, Lord's Covenant, came into the camp, all Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. <clears throat> Here in the uproar, the Philistines asked, what's all this shouting in the Hebrews' camp? When they learned, 
when they learned that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid. A God has come into the camp, they said. Oh, no. Nothing like this has happened before. We're doomed. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues and, want, will, and in the wilderness. Be strong, Philistines. Be men, or you will be subject to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and the Israelites were defeated, and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The Ark of God was captured, and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. That same day, a Benjamite ran from the battle line and went to Shiloh with his clothes torn and dust on his head. When he arrived, there was Eli sitting on his chair by the side of the road, watching, because his heart feared for the Ark of God. When the man entered the town and told what had happened, the whole town sent up a cry. Eli heard the outcry and asked, what is the meaning of this uproar? The man hurried over to Eli, who was 98 years old and whose eyes had failed so that he could not see. He told Eli, I have just come from the battle line. I fled from it this very day. Eli asked, what happened, my son? The man who brought the news replied, Israel fled before the Philistines and the army has suffered heavy losses. Also, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the Ark of God has been captured. When he mentioned the Ark of God, Eli fell backward off his chair by the side of the gate. His neck was broken, and he died, for he was an old man, and he was very heavy. He had led Israel 40 years. His daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant and near the time of delivery. When she heard the news that the Ark of God had been captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she went into labor and gave birth, but was overcome by her labor pains. As she was dying, the woman attending her said, don't despair, you have given birth to a son, but she did not respond or pay any attention. She named the boy Ichabod saying, the glory has departed from Israel because of the capture of the Ark of God and the deaths of her father-in-law and her husband. She said, the glory has departed from Israel for the Ark of God has been captured. After the Philistines had captured the Ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then they carried the Ark into Dagon's temple and set it beside Dagon. When the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. They took Dagon and put him back in his place. But the following morning when they rose, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. His head and hands had been broken off and were lying on the threshold, only his body remained. That is why to this day, neither the priests of Dagon nor any others who enter Dagon's temple at Ashdod step on the threshold. The Lord's hand was heavy on the people of Ashdod and its vicinity. He brought devastation on them and afflicted them with tumors. When the people of Ashdod saw what was happening, they said, the ark of the God of Israel must not stay here with us because his hand is heavy on us and on Dagon, our God. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and asked them, what shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? They answered, have the ark of the God of Israel move to Gath. So they moved the ark of God, the ark of the God of Israel. But after they had moved it, the Lord's hand was against that city, throwing it into a great panic. He, he afflicted the people of the city, both young and old, with an outbreak of tumors. So they sent the Ark of God to Ekron. As the Ark of God was entering Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, they have brought the Ark of the God of Israel around to us to kill us and our people. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and said, send the Ark of the God of Israel away let it go back to its own place or it will kill us and our people. For death had filled the city with panic. God's hand was very heavy on it. Those who did not die were afflicted with tumors and the outcry of the city went up to heaven. When the ark of the Lord had been in Philistine territory seven months, the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners and said, what shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us how we should send it back to its place. 
They answered, if you return the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it back to him without a gift. By all means, send a guilt offering to him. Then you will be healed and you will know why his hand has not been lifted from you. The Philistines asked, what guilt offering should we send to him? They replied, five gold tumors and five gold rats, according to the number of the Philistine rulers, because the same plague has struck both you and your rulers. Make models of the tumors and of the rats that are destroying the country and give glory to Israel's God. Perhaps he will lift his hand from you and your gods and your land. Why do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh did? When Israel's God dealt harshly with them, they did not send the Israelites out so that they could go on their way. Now then, get a new cart ready with two cows that have, been, that have calves and have never been yoked. Hitch the cows to the cart, but take their calves away and pen them. Take the ark of the Lord and put it on the cart, and in a chest beside it, put the gold objects you are sending back to him as a guilt offering. Send it on its way, but keep watching it. If it goes up to its own territory toward Ben Shemesh, then the Lord has brought this great disaster on us. But if it does not, then we will know that it was not his hand that struck us, but that it happened to us by chance. So they did this. They took two such cows and hitched them to the cart and penned up their calves. They placed the ark of the Lord on the cart and along with it, the chest containing the gold rats and the models of the tumors. Then the cows went straight up towards Ben Shemesh, keeping on the road and lowing all the way. They did not turn to the right or to the left. The rulers of the Philistines followed them as far as the border of Beth Shemesh. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were harvesting their wheat in the valley. And when they looked up and saw the ark, they rejoiced at the sight. The cart came to the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh, and there it stopped beside a large rock. The people chopped up the wood of the cart and sacrificed the cows as the burnt offering to the Lord. The Levites looked down at the ark of the Lord together with the chest containing the gold objects and placed them on the large rock. On that day, the people of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and made sacrifices to the Lord. The five rulers of the Philistines saw all this and then returned the same day to Ekron. These are the gold tumors the Philistines sent as guilt offering to the Lord, one each for Ashdod, Gaza, Ashkelton, Gath, and Ekron. And the number of the gold rats was according to the number of Philistine towns belonging to the five rulers. The fortified towns with their, country, with their country villages, the large rock on which the Levites set the ark of the Lord, is a witness to this day in the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. But God struck down some of the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, putting 70 of them to death because they looked into the ark of the Lord. The people mourned because of the heavy blow the Lord had dealt them, and the people of Beth Shemesh asked, who can stand in the presence of the Lord, this holy God? To whom will the ark go up from here? Then they sent messengers to the people of Kiriath Jerim, saying, The Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up to your town. So the men of Kiriath Jerim came and took up the ark of the Lord. They brought it to Abadab's house on the hill and consecrated El. Eleazar, his son, to guard the Ark of the Lord. The Ark remained at Kiriath Jerim a long time, 20 years in all. Then all the people of Israel turned back to the Lord. So Samuel said to all the Israelites, If you are returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and of the Ashtoreths, and commit yourselves to the Lord. And serve him only, and he will deliver you of the hand of the Philistines. So the Israelites put away their Baals and Ashtoreths and served the Lord only. And Samuel said, Assemble all Israel at Mizpah, and I will intercede with the Lord for you. And when they had assembled at Mizpah, they drew water and poured it out before the Lord. On that day they fasted, and there they confessed, We have sinned against the Lord. Now Samuel was serving as leader of Israel at Mizpah. 
When the Philistines heard that the Israel had assembled at Mizpah, the rulers of the Philistines came up to attack them. And when the Israelites heard of it, they were afraid because of the Philistines. They said to Samuel, do not stop crying out to the Lord our God for us, that he may rescue us from the hand of the Philistines. Then Samuel took a suckling lamb and sacrificed it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. He cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf, and the Lord answered him. And when Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to engage Israel in battle. But that day, the Lord thundered with loud thunder against the Philistines and threw them into such a panic that they were routed before the Israelites. The men of Israel rushed out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, slaughtering them along the way to a point below Beth Car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen. He named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and they stopped invading Israel's territory. Throughout Samuel's lifetime, the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines. The towns from Ekron to Gath that the Philistines had captured from Israel were restored to Israel. <clears throat> and Israel delivered the neighboring territory from the hands of the Philistines. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. Samuel continued as Israel's leader all the days of his life. From year to year, he went on a circuit from Bethel to Gilgal to Mizpah, judging Israel and all those places. But he always went back to Ramah, where his home was. And there he also held court for Israel, and he built an altar there to the Lord. All righty. What were the observations in today's reading for... Uh... For you as you were scanning this story what did you see what jumped out at you I saw a few things that were interesting one it had been um you know over I don't know exactly how many years it had been since the Israelites had left Egypt but a long time because Eli was 98 and he was um you know not not one of the uh first people to be in charge. So it had been some time since we had left Egypt and yet um, the um, Philistines recalled, hey, let's not harden our hearts like Egypt. Let's not do what they did. That didn't go well for them. So I thought, you know, um, they had learned from history. <laughs> so um, not enough, not to know that God's hand is always going to be against those that attack his people um, unless he chooses to use them as consequence, but um, but they had caught that. And also, I think it was Phineas's wife. You know, Phineas and Ekron or whatever their names were, were like sketchy, awful dudes. We had just read about how terrible they were, like, you, you know, attacking women at the temple and doing all, you know, taking the God's offering. And yet one of his wives, anyway, the one having Ichabod, the poor child, um, named him Ichabod because the ark of God had part, departed from Israel. So it seemed as if her heart was really for the Lord, even though she was stuck with a, a dud for a husband. <laughs> so and, and found herself experiencing the consequences of that, right? Yeah, totally. <laughs> Yeah, marry well, ladies. That's, uh, well, she may not have had a choice. <laughs> yeah, but some of you do. And I look yes. around and tell you guys are marrying some real duds. I'll tell you that. I don't know how to explain how it's happening now, but some of you guys are choosing badly. <laughs> that through a little bit, will you? you know. Yeah, what did you yeah. see, Steve? <laughs> I, I just see, I just... I, I enjoyed the double crossing plot of, you know, we're, we're stealing the ark. Oh, wait, they gave us the ark to destroy us. <laughs> uh, oops. <laughs> what popped for you, Elizabeth? You know, I just, I always have loved the story of Samuel. And <clears throat> I mean, even from a young age, um, 
you know, before he knew that God was talking to him, he was still obedient and responsive. I mean, when he thought it was Eli, and I just think that that obedient heart served him well his whole life. Um, you know, because he went from, you know, responding right away, um, all the way, right? Like we encourage our kids to do with Eli, thinking that Eli was calling him. And, um, you know, of course, understanding that it was God, but then, you know, to, for this part of scripture to state that, you know, Eli, or not Eli, I mean, Samuel, Samuel served God all of his days and God really entrusted him. And he did just a really, um, a really good job with what he was entrusted with. So that's a really interesting uh, thing to consider too. And, you know, we've talked a lot about that as we parent, uh, just the mm -hmm. idea of, you know, one of the reasons that we want our kids to have what we like to refer to as first-time obedience, what we what we strive for in, in creating first-time obedience is more for their benefit eternally than it is for our benefit as parents. Though so it's way nicer mm -hmm. to have a responsive child than a non-responsive child mm -hmm. to your boys. But the, tr the job is to transfer that uh, over to the Lord as they grow and mature into the women and men of God that they're meant to be and, uh, and to create a, a handoff as it were that, Hey, you know, you're, we're teaching you first time obedience, to obey right away, all the way and with a happy spirit, not so that you obey us right away, all the way and with a happy spirit temporally, but that you respond right away, all the way and with a happy spirit eternally with your God. And, uh, and so the, the skill set we're trying to infuse into the lives of the children is one that we hope will carry them through their whole lives. Now, the the challenge is so multifaceted, right? I mean, to, to get a child to be obedient is um, proven to be somewhat taxing over the years. And I, I, I pity the parents that decide to continue to have children like we did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we tire of this parenting business and and we're at the stage now where uh, most of our friends are are marveling at the wonderment of being grandparents and we're like ah oh, that's that could have been a good idea you know that grandparenting thing sounds delightful you know how do you get these kids i keep trying to send my kids home but they keep and then i remember oh yeah they're mine so there's no to send them <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. Who Sam That's good. Who was Samuel's mom? Was it Hannah? Or mm -hmm. Yeah, it was uh, Hannah. Any, anyway, Hannah had to give her kid to the church for her kid to turn out right. So, um, so <laughs> past, pastor, expect the delivery of six children <laughs> over to your house. <laughs> oh, that's Phenomenal. Great. That's That's the part I missed, the Steve, when I named my son Samuel. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I missed that I was supposed to deliver him to Mark for <laughs> shoot. <laughs> well, That's we... actually one boy I'd probably take right there. Yeah. <laughs> and and my rights for that matter. Well, you guys got good kids. Your Samuel is a pretty special young man, though. That's for sure. He is. Ooh. He's got a great heart. Well, yeah, well, both. Both of you, I think, are testimonies to this idea of, of you know, raising your kids uh, in a way that brings uh, them the best opportunity of knowing God. And, uh, mm -hmm. and yet, uh, you know, when I look back over the, over the history of humanity, and you know who else I think had a really good chance of raising kids in a way that would bring honor to God? Adam and Eve, who were pretty <laughs> darn close to the source. And I think it goes to show you just how tricky and difficult the task is, um, and how no matter what you choose to do, uh, they get to choose their own way. Mm -hmm. And it's the same way with the, the Lord. I think he looks probably down on all of us in humanity and says, uh, this would be really easy for you if you would uh, submit your hearts to me and follow me, but we all get to choose our own way, you know, and, uh, and that's where it gets all kind of crazy, right? Yeah, you know, and boy, God's perfect. And Adam and Eve, his first children, still made poor choices. So this whole yeah, free Adam, will business. Adam and Eve did, and then Adam and Eve's kids, you know, that was a mixed bag. 
of sorts, but yeah, it's mm. tricky with raising kids. What dilemma did Samuel and Eli, uh, what dilemma faced Samuel when he questioned, when Eli questioned him about God's message? Oh, oh that was a terrible position to put that boy in. <laughs> Very bad. Uh, so, okay, so say more about that. I mean, so you're saying God put him in a terrible position? Well, I think um, obviously it was the right thing to do, but when you are a young child raised up by this old man and you are told this terrible news, to have to deliver that news to someone, um, Samuel obviously cared for because he's caring. I mean, Eli is old in his 90s, right? or 80s maybe at this time, who knows, we don't know, but he's older. And so even to think like of having to deliver this terrible news to my grandfather, you know, you worry about just sharing the news. What is this going to do to him? You know, these terrible things are gonna happen. I, I wouldn't wanna be the deliverer of that news. Mm -hmm. So. And what were you going to say, Elizabeth? It looks like you had oh, just fun. just the same thing. I mean, just uh, um, I mean, I think of God when my my brother passed away unexpectedly, and um, and then it was going to be my job to share that with my mom. I mean, it was really, and I was an adult, you know. It was just really tough to share hard news, and um, you know, but maybe Samuel was young enough that. Um, yeah, I mean, he was a boy, so maybe it was a relief to Samuel at the same time to uh, be able to not have to hold that in confidence. Um, so mm -hmm. I guess I don't know, I could look at it both ways, but certainly nobody ever wants to be the bearer of bad news. And, uh, and that's what that was. So, well, and what do you think it, 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 it meant, I mean, it's, it's so this was how Samuel begins, right? I mean, he begins having this vocal ministry uh, and out of the gate is demonstrating that he can be trusted with the delivery of hard news. Mm -hmm. And, and so out of, you know, out of the, out of the beginnings of his ministry, he's able to reflect hard honest uh truth from god to people he loves and uh and it marks his ministry as uh as somebody who impacts all of israel by delivering often hard uh strikingly difficult news in a way that was filled with integrity and allowed people to hear and believe that the news was in fact from god and uh and so it it was the it was really the the entrance into a a kind of ministry that would uh be his to carry for the rest of his life and in, in all reality right. you know and so but you know i i i also wonder you know if if it was um for eli a sense like oh wait a second um he didn't he didn't make that up last night uh he heard from, he heard from god i mean if it wasn't a clarifier like uh this kid is really hearing the voice of god you know i mean the what it's not like you're, this kid comes out out of uh out of a out of a moment and says hey this is this is what happens and eli goes yeah i think you made that up you know <laughs> right <laughs> you know what i mean it's like <laughs> went, okay this is a big deal uh, God is speaking, and He's using this boy as a as a voice. So there was a quite a moment, really, in a lot of in a lot of ways, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Well, and if you think about it, it you know Eli and Samuel, it, it's a teacher and a student relationship. Um, you know, you can see how how God does want to use younger kids. Um, yeah. You know, you got the innocent, you got the innocence of the instruction. Uh, so that that's been their only passion is to learn. And so uh, there does come a trust factor uh, when you when you have an untainted child uh, who has learned all the things of the Lord and now is putting it into practice. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of power to that. 
uh, a lot of application and a lot of trust that can come out of that. Uh, so, you know, I think of all of the young kids through the Bible, you know, with, with Samuel and then just down the road, we're getting into David again. And I think of, of Timothy in the New Testament, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of, a lot of young kids who have a lot of knowledge of who God is, uh, can be trusted uh, in, in that godly message. It's really good. Mm-hmm. Why isn't it safe to assume that the presence of the symbols of God guarantee the presence of God? Wow. I mean, God is so much more than a symbol. I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe back in their day, although, I mean, that's where God dwelt. So, I mean, it's, I think maybe easier for us to see that currently now um, because he dwells within us. And I mean, I, even though the cross is a symbol of Jesus' sacrifice, I would not, you know, equate that God is with us because we have a cross. Mm-hmm. So, but for them, he did dwell in the, the Ark of the Covenant. So, but I think, um, you know, they started to take the Ark as like, well, we're going to win because we're marching with the ark, you know, and mm-hmm. it did, mm-hmm. regardless of whether God had instructed them and God had been clear before, like, I'm not going with you. You know, mm-hmm. he had done it with the Israelites when um, they did not want to go into the promised land. And then they changed their mind and no, we will go into the promised land. They didn't obey right away. And he's like, go ahead and go. I'm not going. Mm-hmm. And uh, they got annihilated, you know, and it's the same thing. They didn't they didn't um, seek the Lord. They just thought we've got the magic ark. We'll walk in and everything, you know, will, will happen for us. I think we sometimes do that. We rush into something without, without asking God. Um, we want him to follow our plan instead of us following in his plan. So we've, we've done that in other ways, I guess. Sorry. You know, one of the movies I've always, well, I've always really appreciated. I really like is a movie called the apostle and, uh, and there's a scene in the movie, The Apostle, where uh, the lead character throws a Bible or sets a Bible on the on the on the ground and challenges a bulldozer to drive over it, and uh, and the bulldozer driver is like vexed, terribly vexed. He won't drive over this Bible because of what it symbolizes to him, and uh, and how uh, so often I think we we uh, use. Christian symbols in a in a very uh, uh, similar kind of a fashion to kind of believe that that okay God resides in this in this symbol and uh, and there's power in the symbol and uh, the the nature of humanity even though we aren't probably given to um, in our Western world mindset to, into the into the uh, kind of some of the so we don't think we don't think of it as these as magical, but we do kind of think of them as powerful in some ways. And so even in a my favorite artist, Steve, dropped a new song yesterday. Nice. About symbols. <laughs> uh, it's called Church. There we go. It's called Church and it's it's heavily uh, Bible symbolic um, and cross symbolic and and uh, he's he's questioning whether his name's Tom McDonald, and he uh, he has a, a battle in this song between uh, whether or not you know the church can help him or whether uh, whiskey can help him. You know, does he turn to whiskey or does he turn to the church? And and uh, and that's his internal battle that he's uh, articulating in this song. But it's uh, it's it's got this one. Uh, symbolic uh, element where he's got tattoos on his on his knuckles that say fear and he's turning the pages of the scripture and you can see fear on his hands as he's moving the bible and the fear tattoo is really there and he's moving the pages of the bible it's like oh my gosh that is really great symbolism I pray on my way to the liquor store that they love I
you'll stay with me My eyes can't see from the bottles of whiskey I don't believe anybody will miss me And I'm on my knees, tell me God are you listening? that we approach the the god of the universe with fear is probably a good one uh yeah. and that we would revere the word is probably a good idea but the power isn't in the in the words of the uh, the publisher's book it's it's in the the living words of god themselves and so uh the pages are just really symbolic of that and so it's a it's an interesting thing that that parallel between uh, where our heart is in relationship to some of these symbols, I think is a, is a high value, but the symbol itself is only reflective of the God with whom the symbol reflects, right? I mean, it's... Uh, right. I mean, it's a good balance though, Pastor. And, and you know, like Jenny said, the, the symbols were the life, you know, it was all about the temple. And, and you read through about what what all of those items were for. And we just read through many pages of of... This is what, you know, these are the symbols. They define the symbols. This is the purpose of the symbols, you know. And so it, it the symbols are definitely integrated into culture, into tradition. Yeah, uh, I, I love And so too. to make that connection from symbol to the greater God, you know, that that's a tough, tough connection to make. I love too that in this, uh, in this story that you, you see their uh, fall in as much as they they put this symbol out in front like the symbol was going to save them without inviting God really to fight their battle for mm -hmm. them. and uh, and ultimately uh, their pride and their arrogance becomes their downfall you know they're all cheering yay God has arrived in camp you know? and uh, and God was like I'm not fighting this battle for you guys uh, and allows himself to be captured really and brought into their other, the other camp. And then the other camp is like, yay, we got their God. And then the, it's like, uh, we don't want their God. <laughs> you know, uh, this, our possessing him is, uh, is a bad idea. And, uh, and they're trying to possess his presence uh, with something that ultimately they're like, uh, let's get rid of that deal and uh and give them back and so there is something really really rich about the nature of of our god who is uncontainable who we do not get to use to uh, to fight our battles but we'll fight our battles often if he's if he's invited you know but we don't get to say because we're a christian we won't lose a battle or we'll put the bible out in front of us or we'll walk with a cross and and that's going to ma matter. No, it's 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 our submitting our lives to Him, and His going before us mm -hmm. that matters. Not our using Him as a tool to win the day. Uh, he's not a tool to be used to win the day. <clears throat> but as we submit our lives to Him, He will often allow us to win the day. So, Father God, we want to mm -hmm. find ourselves uh, winning the day, and uh, we know that we do that by allowing our hearts to yield to Your purposes. So God, give us wisdom and insight and courage to bend our knee and bow our hearts before your uh, your son, the uh, one true God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We ask that you would guide us and lead us in a strong, personal, and powerful way. Uh, it is in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, gang. Uh, thank you so much for uh, being with us. Uh, Steve, 
Jenny, Elizabeth, this was a, a good day to uh, bring uh, this word to the church and to those who listen online. So God bless you guys. Make it a great day. Submit your hearts and lives to him and uh, go live it well. See you, gang. Yeah, good. Have a good Bye. day, everyone.